can't start your video because the host has disabled it. Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> Finally, um, two or three false starts, but I think we're there now. I'll start again. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Olympic Federation of Ireland Gender Equality in Sport Online Series. We are delighted that so many of you have uh, joined us. We had initially 130 plus signed up. I think 70 or 80 are here already, and it's climbing already. There'll be a few latecomers, but then there's all the stragglers, isn't there? Um, this is the first of four webinars that we'll be hosting in uh, the month of July, every Wednesday around this time. Today, obviously, uh, leadership and coaching with the overall overarching theme of gender equality, uh, um, taking us right through the whole way. First and foremost, uh, let's go and meet the boss, shall we? Uh, Sarah Keane, President of the Olympic Federation of Ireland, and uh, very relevantly for this particular discussion, Chair of the European Olympic Committee on uh, Gender Equality joins us now. Good afternoon, Sarah. There, I think now I'm live as well. Good afternoon, Mark, and everyone else. And again, I um, also welcome you to the first of our Gender Equality in Sport online series. And I really am delighted to see so many of you join us. Thank you for taking the time today. Over the next four weeks, we're going to explore the theme of gender equality. And one of the things I'm, I'd like to share with you is that one of the things I've learned um, on the various domestic and international committees that I've been involved in, in relation to gender equality, is that most people are actually eager um, and they want to support gender balance and they want to make change. But the challenge is often about how do you go about doing this? And we really hope that this series will help you with this. It's one of the primary um, aims of this series. You're gonna hear from some outstanding leaders in sport, uh, both in Ireland and some from further afield. And we hope and we know that they will inspire you. But we also hope and intend that they will give you some concrete ideas and examples of things to work on in order to support you in your journey to bring about gender parity within your own organization. We're really delighted and honored to have Mark with us today and all the other leaders in coaching that you're gonna hear from. So without further delay, I'm gonna hand over to Mark, who's gonna go through housekeeping and then kick off the first session on leaders in coaching. Thank you again for joining us and I really hope you enjoy the series. Thank you, Sarah. Now, um, today we're gonna to focus on leaders in coaching. We have coaching leaders across four sports to share their learnings with you. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, muted all participants here today, but we would like to invite you uh, to ask questions that be the Q&A link, which you'll see on your screens. We're going to take all the questions at the end of the presentations. Firstly, I want to uh, welcome, a huge welcome indeed, to Lisa Fallon, who is the head coach of the London City Lionesses, who play in the FA Women's Championship. Now, she is the only Republic of Ireland born head coach working in the top two divisions of men's or women's professional football in the UK. She has a wealth of experience in leadership across both men's and women's teams, including a role in the backroom team with the All-Ireland uh, winning Dublin men's senior football team in 2018. And in uh, 2013, Lisa became the first woman to manage a senior men's team in Ireland. She's going to share some of her experiences and her learnings from working her way through to the top level of management in what is uh, obviously and widely regarded as uh, a male dominated sport. Good afternoon, Lisa. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you, even if it is only down the end of a, of, a, of, a, of a screen and a camera. I haven't had the pleasure in person yet. Um, you've had a phenomenal uh, rise and possibly not gotten enough credit and recognition for it. So maybe this will go some way to, um, to redressing that. Afternoon. Thanks very much, Mark. And um, it's a real honour to be involved in this um, seminar series. And I'd like to thank the Olympic Federation of Ireland for inviting me to share some of my learnings over the last number of years. Um, my piece will be generally quite reflective. Um, so I'm going to share some of my learnings of being a female coach in a male dominated environment um, and that journey from being in that environment to being a manager and now somebody hopefully who is in a position to share experiences and, and help to affect some positive change. So I'm gonna do this as, um, a, a, I'll lead with a bit of a presentation. So I'll chat over it. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. So hopefully everybody will be able to see this. If there's any problems, you might let me know. But 
hopefully everybody can, can see this. So basically, what is equality? First and foremost for me, this was probably one of the, the things that I actually got wrong. Um, I thought I knew what equality was, but the reality was I, I probably genuinely didn't. I thought it was about being treated the same. Um, but if you look the word equality up in the dictionary, the definition says that it is the state of being equal, especially in status, rights or opportunities. So I'm just going to leave that with you and I'll come back to it towards the end. But for me, one of the key challenges I faced was in perception. So being a female in a male dominated environment, I learned that sometimes people look at the same thing and see something different. And for me, that was one of the most important lessons that I personally had to learn was that sometimes the way I saw something was different to the way everybody else. And that would be the same as a coach or a player. And that was a key component of my work was learning that when we see things, that it can be different how we perceive them and how different people perceive them. So some person can look at something and see it as a negative, whereas somebody else can look at something and see it as quite a positive. And for me, that was a key learning, that sometimes people saw me being in a male sports environment as a positive, and some people saw it as a negative. So I also learned then about subconscious bias, and we've all got them including me, which was something that was a, a big lesson for me. So when I was working in coaching, what I often found was that once I was in a track suit and on the side of the pitch, the natural assumption was that I was the physio. And if I had got a euro for every time I was asked if I was a physio, I probably could have retired about two years ago. Now there's nothing wrong with being a physio, but this was often the perception of, of people who were in sport that once I was there in the environment that that was what I must be. On one occasion, I was um, away in Europe scouting for Cork City for the Europa League. And um, I was introduced to the opposition manager. And he said, ah, Miss Fallon, you must be the travel agent. So it was <laughs> part, it was, it was an interesting one because part of me was thinking, you know, I could be really offended here at the fact that he thought I was a travel agent. Or I just said, do you know what? Fair enough. I'm not even going to fight that battle. I asked him, could I go and have a look at the, um, the pitches uh, to have a look at the surfaces? And he said, yeah, no problem. So I went out and he said, don't mind us, we're training. And this was a few days before we played them. So they were actually practicing set pieces. And because he thought I was a travel agent, he just assumed that I couldn't possibly be the opposition scout. So sometimes people's subconscious biases can actually give you an advantage. Um, but for me, the biggest thing there was my mindset about how I dealt with it. And did I allow that subconscious bias to be a setback for me um, and a deterrent for me to deliver for my managers and the people that employed me by feeling victimized? Or could I have the mindset that, fine, if that's what you think, that's your, that's, a, that's your problem, but I'm just going to carry on and do my work. So we're going to run a little poll here. So um, you should be able to see a little poll, but basically the question is, what colour is the dress? And you've got about 30 seconds, so if you can um, interact with that and just finalize what you what color that dress is that you see and then we can um, get a look at the results but the interesting thing for me was this and I use this all the time with groups that I work with is that sometimes we can all be absolutely looking at exactly the same thing but that sometimes what we see is actually completely different now I can see here from the poll that some of you think that dress is white and gold and some of you think that that dress is blue and black. And generally in my experience, when we do this in a room, it's generally divided 60-40 or 50-50 even at times, but it's always a fairly even spread as to exactly what the, um, the, the results are. And I'm looking here at our poll and the poll tells me 
that 46% of the people looking at this picture right now think the dress is white and gold, and 54% think that this dress is blue and black. Now, I'd say we can all probably agree that we're looking at a dress. But the interesting thing is we're all looking at the same thing, but really see something differently. And if you see white and gold, I'd say there's no way that I could convince you that that dress is black and blue. And if you see blue and black, there is absolutely no way I'd say I could convince you to say that that dress is white and gold. So my, th my question is, if everybody in this room right now watching this, was in a jury and you had to decide unanimously what the color of the dress was, could you do it? Could you be persuaded that the dress is a completely different color? And quite often that touches and resonates with what people have to do when they see something in one way. But the reality is sometimes you have to be able to see it in a different way in order for it to work. The dress actually, believe it or not, is blue and black. I personally see white and gold, um, but apparently it's down to how you process light. So it's, it's quite an interesting one. Um, and generally it always splits the room fairly evenly, but, but that is an interesting one in terms of that the subconscious biases that we have when we see things can be really, really different. So if you're going to affect change and on this one, what I will do is, I'm just gonna stop the share here for a second. And what I'll ask you to do is, when you, if you could all clasp your hands. So if you see the picture there, clasp your hands in exactly that way. So what some of you will see is, your left thumb is over your right thumb. And some of you will see that your right thumb is over your left thumb. And what is different, what is interesting about this is if you unlace your hands and relace them back the opposite way so that your opposite thumb is over the other one. So if you all do that and straight away, I'll ask you, how does that feel? Now, I know I can't hear any of you, but mostly you will have probably experienced that it feels really, really strange. It feels really different and it just feels wrong. So what I'll ask you to do is open your hands and lace them back the right way, then the wrong way, then the right way, then the wrong way, and do it really quickly. Just keep interlacing your hands one way, then the other way. And as you do it, the point of this is, is that at the start when something feels really different, if you keep and stick with it, eventually it will not be so different. So if you take your hands apart now, put them back together as normal, and then relace them the opposite way. And straight away, you will feel that all of a sudden it doesn't feel as different as it did 40 seconds ago. So my point is that generally, in order to do something different, it feels wrong, but if you stick with it, or it can feel unusual, or it takes you out of your comfort zone, but if you stick with it, that very quickly it can become quite normal and you can feel that it's, it's actually not as uncomfortable as it was at the start. So for me, the point is that it generally shouldn't be about being different, but, but, but when, we come, when it comes to gender equality, sometimes it actually is. But can you give different people an opportunity? It's not about giving somebody a different opportunity. It's can you give a different person the opportunity, even though at the start it might feel a little bit unusual. So in my own experience, I found that once I was in, I became quite normalized in the male and female elite sports environments. Sometimes it was a little bit unusual at the start or a little bit different for everybody, but very quickly I did feel and become quite normalized. There were times that I did feel isolated. Um, and I felt honestly that I had to do more to prove myself. Um, 
And if I'm really honest, and it's probably not something I've talked a lot about through my journey, but now it probably can, but I certainly did experience challenges that male coaches in the same environments did not experience. And on a couple of occasions, I was also denied opportunities because it would be difficult to appoint a woman into a particular role. And it wouldn't be right to expect you to be away from your children, but that certainly wasn't considered for an issue for a male member of staff. So on the second one about the being away from the children, that was actually said to me in a way that it, the person felt they were being considerate and being helpful to me. It wasn't meant to be in a way that would make me feel bad or they felt they were doing me a favor by, by saying that. But my, my point is that for some people that might be right, for some women that might be right, but for some others it isn't. And again, that was down to the subconscious bias of the person who said it to me, that they thought they were doing the right thing, even though for me it came across as that it wasn't because I didn't want to be denied and I felt I shouldn't be denied an opportunity because it would mean being away from, from home. But this one I want to touch on is being my biggest lesson. And I actually learned this um, only in 2019, January 2019. I was on a course um, about diversity, equality and inclusion. And for me, this was a really interesting day um, for many reasons, because I was in a room full of guys, football coaches, and they said to me, the, what does equality mean? And a few of us said, oh, it means being treated the same. And he said to me, do you think you should be treated the same as everyone else in the room? And I said, yes, absolutely. But the reality is that he said, I don't think you should be treated the same. And I wasn't, I didn't agree with that. But he told this little story and I'm going to share that with you today because it's one thing that made me think in a slightly different way. So he said, if three people go to a football match and there's a fence at the match and we're going to treat all three people the same, they want to see the game. So we're going to treat all of them the same and give them a little box to watch the game. So person one can see the game. Person two can just about see the game. And person three cannot see the game. So in order to achieve equality, we actually have to treat the three people differently. So person one gets that size box. Person two gets that size box. And person three gets a bigger box. Now there is equality because all three people can see the game. All three people can experience the same outcome. And that's actually what equality is, is about having the opportunity to achieve the same outcome as opposed to being treated the same. So apparently now, the way I think about it is, it's not necessarily about being treated the same. And that for me was a big thing. I had to accept that, but not feel that it was any, a weakness on my behalf. It's about the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, or opportunities. And now when I read that statement, I see it differently and I understand it in a different way. So my question to you is, can you affect change? Are you aware of your own subconscious biases? Can you challenge them? Are you prepared to do something differently? Are you prepared to give the support that's needed? The challenges I faced, and when I reflect on it, this is the truth. I didn't always speak up about unfair challenges because I didn't want to be a problem. I knew that being a female in those environments was slightly unusual, and I didn't want to come across as being a problem and risking the, having the opportunity taken away. I did on occasions accept that it would be more difficult because I was a woman. And I'm not sure on reflection, I should have accepted that. 
and I did accept at times that dealing with sexism, sexism was par for the course. And again, on reflection, I'm not sure I should have done that. So I leave you with the final question. Is equality about treating people in a way that allows them to achieve the same outcome? So I hope there's a few little thoughts there, um, just reflections really, um, and um, a few things that I learned along the way. Um, so that's it from me. Um, Mark, I will hand back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I just have one or two questions for you very quickly. When we were doing uh, a run through a little earlier on, um, I asked you about resistance or hurdles that you might have encountered when walking into, a, you know, particularly the male dominated uh, areas that you've worked. And you said something very interesting to me, which was this. No, you didn't experience much resistance from the athletes and sports people that you were working with because elite people are so focused and I suppose have to be so selfish to achieve their goals that they're only interested in whether you can make them better or help them improve. But you also said, as part of the answer to that, that, that the resistances you found or met were external to the group or the environment you were working in. Could you expand on that a little bit and tell us how you dealt with it and what you meant by it and how you dealt with it? Um, I'll give you one example. Um, so say, for example, we were um, at a game and I was out helping with the warm up of the players. And um, I was with a male team at the time and the supporters from the other team were singing at me to get my mm -hmm. bits out for the lads. And I remember I just had to ignore it and carry on because my job was to make sure that everything worked properly. Um, and the lads, some of the players, I remember saying to me, how do you even put up with that? Like, that's a, you shouldn't have to deal with that. But they knew I did. And they knew there was nothing really that they could do about it. Or could anybody do about it? The most important thing on the day was that I focused on the job and I made sure that I did what I was supposed to do to make sure we were ready for the game. But, and that is one small aspect. There are, like, there are others. Um, but sometimes I found that people, people said things because they thought they might be cool or funny um, when they weren't. But again, I had to be professional. I had to have self-respect and dignity. And I also had the responsibility to the people who had given me opportunities to be able to just operate in the environment and not allow what I was being subjected to to weaken the team in any way or our preparations or my ability to deliver what was needed for the team. So, but when I reflect, yes, should I have had to experience some of those incidences? Absolutely not. However, I hope that by sharing them and some of the stories and some of my own learnings that um, it helps people to to be able to stand up and go, do you know what? We shouldn't have to deal with that in order to just pursue the jobs that we want to do and the jobs that we're, we're actually good at. Okay. In, in terms of, um, the, obviously this is about gender equality and, and uh, the idea is, is that we will get more um, women, young women, to the same position that you were in. Um, so for somebody starting out thinking that their path will be coaching, they want to end up working, you know, like you do, did with the Dublin senior team or working with a, a, a Premier League or a championship team in the UK as a, as a senior coach, possibly even manager. manager. Um, what's the one takeaway? What's the one piece of advice that you would give them about um, how to go about it, what they should do, and, and possibly what they should ignore? Um, well, I think... The first thing I would say is never, ever underestimate the impact that you can have on someone's life. Because I know for a fact that whilst it was challenging for me in those environments, I also think that it was challenging for the people who gave me opportunities at times because they had stepped out of their comfort zone. Um, so what I would say is if you are a person who can make a decision, 
can you put someone who is in a job for the right reason and then give them the support to do that job, even if it is at the start a little bit different. So for me, the key thing would be um, judge the person, not about whether they're male or female, but the person and then put them in and give them the support that they need to do the job and go on the journey and never ever underestimate the impact that you can have on someone's life, be that positive or negative. Mm. The, the, the problem with gender equality, not just in sport, but in life is, is that um, you have to, we have to have people who are willing to give people a chance, not people who take the chance, but people who will give you the chance to prove uh, your equality. And it's ridiculous that we even have to say that still in this day and age, but that's the course. So there's courage required on both sides. The people who have the jobs are in the position to give you the opportunity. And then obviously you uh, have to have the courage to go for your dreams. For the, for the time being, Lisa, we're going to leave it at that. Please stay with us because we will have a, 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 a lively Q&A towards the end. But uh, uh, for ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if she'll even say that in the gender equality webinar, but to all of you, uh, like in your own quiet way, would you... Uh, Give a round of applause to Lisa Fallon there because she's given us a lot to think about. Now, um, let's move on to our, uh, our second uh, speaker today, and it is Bernard Dunn, who certainly won't need any direct, uh, um, any introduction to, uh, to an Irish audience and, and some international boxing fans as well. He is the performance director with the Irish Amateur Boxing Association. He's going to be talking about the, uh, the changing landscape in, in boxing following a, a surge of interest in in women's boxing, of course, uh, we've had tremendous success over the last couple of years with Katie and uh, with Kelly. Um, he's going to specifically talk about the, uh, the measures that he's putting in place to ensure that the future of boxing will see talented and competent female coaches emerge from the system. Effectively, what he's doing is, is that he's, uh, he's putting in place procedures and protocols that are going to do him and people like him out of a job, which is... Um, you know, which is very selfless of him, but then if you knew the man, you'd understand. Uh, many of you will already be familiar with Bernard. He's a retired professional boxer. He uh, has picked up world and European uh, uh, titles. He uh, holds a master's degree in sports, exercise and performance psychology. He's a published author and, of course, a passionate Gwilgar as well. Performs a lifestyle coach with the, uh, the Dublin um, men's senior uh, All-Ireland winning, five in a row All-Ireland winning team. And since 2017, he has headed up the elite Irish boxing team as the performance director. Uh, Bernard, you're very welcome. Good afternoon. Nice to see you, sir. You're actually right. looking better today now than you did when you were in your fighting prime. Right, so nobody's hitting me anymore. Life is good. <laughs> uh, apart from when I, I'm in the gym and there's a couple of straight punches flying around, but uh, no, life is, life is generally good. Um, I have to say it's been really interesting to me and I, I kind of had planned to talk around a, a certain piece um, but even just the, the notes that I've taken just from Sarah and from uh, Lisa um, has kind of probably diverted how I was going to speak. Um, one thing I took, especially from Lisa's one, is that I need to get my eyes tested because I saw a purple dress and that wasn't even one of the options. So, yeah, a little bit on the for that one. Um, I, I, I come from a predominantly... Um, it's historical, it's a tradition, it's a male sport. And um, there's nothing we can do about that in terms of uh, change. But what we can influence is the future of our sport. Um, when I went for my interview uh, for my role in 2007, uh, a big part of the interview process and a big part of what I was, uh, I suppose, portraying as where I saw the future was the equality within our system bringing our female program right up in line with our male program. Um, and thankfully, I have a federation uh, who fully supported that and gave me the opportunity to take on that role. Um, we had a major, we had a major event, uh, I suppose a catalyst, if you will, um, here in 2012 that launched female participation in this country right, right through the roof. We had Katie Taylor winning an Olympic gold medal. That has inspired so many young females to come into our sport. And we have, we have seen the benefits of it and we will continue to see the benefits of that. Um, she hasn't just been a catalyst in terms of female participation as athletes, uh, but also as uh, future, I will see those, those athletes turn it into future coaches. And how do we help those athletes develop right through? For me coming into the program, 
Um, we saw the potential of it. Uh, in the three years, I suppose, that I've been there, um, the team has been successful enough, that female squad, and winning eight European medals, uh, a world gold medal. Um, I think they had a, a couple of top eights in the world as well. And, you know, just to see those results come on back in, um, it's been fantastic. And in those short few in, in those short few years, we were up to five Olympic weights. And we're in the next we're in the next Olympic cycle, we will have uh, equality in terms of participation that we're in our sport. So the need to invest in in our female uh, athletes in our program is hugely important and uh, is one that both our federation and high performance are, are, are greatly involved in. Listening to Lisa there, it, I just, I'm just reading some of the notes that I've written. Uh, listening to Lisa there about how we're going to go about affecting change. A big piece for me, I would see, is we have a federation who is hugely passionate around female participation, wanting to get female coaches involved, wanting you know, more female athletes you know, continuously getting into the system. Uh, I think where, where there's probably a little gap there is you know, there's no alignment with high-performance coaching and federation coaching uh, programs. Maybe if we had a piece of uh, a communication piece between high performance, co- I remember our high performance coaching team is one of the best teams in world sport. And to not, to not fully harness and uh, you know utilize that knowledge, that experience, and um, that these coaches have developed over the last number of years, where they've gone to numerous world, European, and Olympic games, and shared that with our club coaches. Uh, whilst they're going on to federation programs. I think there's an opportunity to probably miss there. And uh, if there's members of our federation are, are watching this, I'm, I'm sure we will can discuss this at a, a later stage. Um, but for me, that's a piece I took out of it. Um, and listen to Sarah, how do we go about doing this, getting gender parity? We've, we've been fortunate, my sport. Uh, we had that event, we had that catalyst, that was Katie Taylor. Uh, you know, now we've got to increase participation and we've got to accept that there is a need for change. If we're going to have a parity within uh, participation numbers, we need, to, we need to increase our coaching numbers uh, coming right through the system. Because female athletes and male athletes do have different needs. Um, we also have a leadership piece in place. Uh, our core leadership team um, does consist mainly of males. And again, that's historical. But I think we have we have a potential future leader in our system. Um, we have a high performance manager in place who, who assists me in everything that I do and is uh, developing leadership qualities. She's, she's dealing with athletes. She travels with teams. Um, succession planning is in place within our high performance unit for a future potential PD within our system. If not within boxing, we're definitely within another sport. Um, that's a huge piece for me that I see going forward. Um, and offering co- coaching opportunities for those right now with our athletes, we see that as a huge benefit for the likes of it, Kelly Harrington, uh, Michaela Walsh, uh, Grania Walsh, Christina Desmond, Amy Broadhurst. These are all world-class athletes. If we can transfer their athletic skills into coaching skills and, and actually help them develop whilst they're in our system, that's one of the programs that we're running within, our, within the unit at this moment in time. And as a result from that, we will hopefully see an increase in our, in our um, participating coaches. I, my big takeaway from all of this is I think federations need to have a complete alignment with their high performance structures. Uh, generally, within your high performance structures, you have experts in their fields who have untold knowledge and experience um, that can be shared with all athletes and um, all coaches coming through. Um, and you want to download that, you want to harness it, you want to utilize it as best you can for any aspiring young coach coming through to gain access to it. Um, I'm not saying what our federations are doing are wrong. I think what they're doing is exceptional. But you can add on to that. You can enhance it by working with your high performance groups. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Just um, very quickly, because I, I'm, I have um, 
Sally Corsladen and Sally Johnson to talk to you as well before we open up the Q&A. Just a very quick question for you. You know that much use saying, if she can't see it, she can't be it. Okay, we, 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 we have Katie, we have Kelly, we have the Walshes coming up. So those in terms of, um, you know, boxing and athletics are the role models. But when they go back to their corner, they don't see women in their corner. How long or how far away are we from that happening? There are female coaches that travel um, with our squads. Um, they travel quite a lot with their age teams as well. And it's, it's, it's a program that's in place. Um, I know uh, Lisa Clancy and the Federation have been working behind the scenes on getting a coach enhancement program in place. Uh, we've had input into that. Um, it's about, I, 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 I see it as a, it's a progress piece. Uh, we have athletes now who are coming to the fore. Um, and I think we will see athletes who have come through the system will then progress, hopefully, um, like their male counterparts into coaching. Okay, Bernard, listen, for the time being, thank you very much. We will, of course, be back to you during the course of uh, the Q&A. Now, uh, we've had two other um, uh, panellists, uh, very patiently and very quietly, uh, standing by. Um, Sally Corsgadden, who's the Performance Director with Horse Sport Ireland, and Sally Johnson, who is the Performance Director with Gymnastics Ireland. I'm going to go to Sally Corsgadden, uh, first of all. Um, thank you for your patience, Sally. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. Could you uh, describe briefly to us your journey um, to where you are now in, in your sport. What were the main steps that you took along the way? And indeed, what advice would you give to young women or indeed men starting out on their journey? Well, oh, thank you very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I suppose, yes, yeah, starting out, you know, I came from a, a horsey family. So horses were in our childhood and I actually had three brothers and a twin brother. So from the word go, I've been competing with men, I suppose, can, competing equally. And in our sport, you know, it's, there's no favor given whether you're a man or woman. It's all about how you compete on a horse. Um, and actually, those horses brought me to Ireland and I met my husband and I've been here 30 years. So, you know, it really did, horses have been, made my life and made my career. Absolutely love competing. And to help myself compete, I had to earn money and earn money by coaching got involved with the junior and young rider programs, realized that I, you know, actually liked that and actually was quite good at it. Had a great opportunity to be part of the Pursuit of Excellence program uh, to cope with the Irish Institute of Sport, which uh, really opened my mind to looking outside our sport and learning so much from other coaches. And uh, although it was, there was more, there were more men than women on it, but it never felt, it felt a very self, self place. Everybody was uh, given a great, you know, the same opportunities to take and great learning. Um, so I suppose that gave me the confidence to go for the top job and the role that I'm in now as performance director. I suppose, the, you know, again, with our sports, from the word go, I've had great, uh, good role models. You know, we've always had successful women winning at world championships and Olympics and Europeans in the likes of Lucinda Green and Ginny Leng. Um, you know, they were really professional. So um, it's, it's just, I suppose, never really, you don't really think of it in our sport because at every, whether you're an official or a coach or a competitor, there's always that mixture uh, of men and women taking on responsibility. I suppose You've, um, sorry, sorry to cut across you. I mean, eventing um, is generally a gender neutral sport in the sense that the performance isn't based on uh, physical ability, uh, which puts it in a unique position of having men and women on the team. Does this lend itself automatically uh, or naturally to a gender balance in participation levels at the elite end? It has changed. It starts off at the entry level you would say there's more females than males there's a lot of girls ride ponies when it become when it gets to elite especially in the last 10 years um you know it's become a more professional sport there's a lot more competitions it's more demanding um, on time i think it's it's now tending to become more male dominated but actually at championships and on teams we're still seeing a good gender balance and and you know what women are are out there and sticking to it are, are, be, are very good and can compete as with the best in the world. 
Um, uh, and is that gender balance um, um, all the way through um, up to the top levels of, of coaching and administration as well? Yes, I'd say, um, although in my role as a high performance director, um, and I go to meetings with other high performance directors, yeah, there, there are less women, but I think it's, but sort of in, with the officials, with the judges, the stewards, um, it does tend, there's a good, there's a good mix of men and women. Um, I don't see, and I think actually, and coaching, I think it's, um, no, we still have a good mix. It's probably maybe at the elite level, but I think it's not so much, you know, I think it's, it all comes down to, you know, women, we are the homemakers and we, um, you know, do have to have children. And I think it's that always comes down to that balance between career and family. Okay, uh, can I move to um, Sally Johnston now, who's the uh, performance director with Gymnastics Ireland. Good afternoon, um, Sally. Thank you for joining us and indeed, thank you for your patience. Um, can you describe your journey to where you are in the sport and uh, indeed what were the main steps that you took along the way and what advice would you give to young uh, men or women starting out on their journey? Okay, thank you, Mark. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my journey started uh, as a child. I had a very excitable child. I was running around everywhere. And I think when I was about five, I got involved in to gymnastics. Uh, my family is a very sporting family. Uh, we swim in athletics and we all did gymnastics at our early ages. And I loved it. And I found it easy and I really enjoyed it. So with that, I stayed in the sport. Um, went into coaching and then moved to Ireland and in Ireland I came here especially to do gymnastics actually I ran a club and then I went to work for Gymnastics Ireland and first of all I went to coach education which was a fantastic start because there was no education here at all for gymnastics so I had a clean slate and had to prepare all the courses and to start from there and then I went into um, performance uh, and it was kind of a natural progression that happened in 2011 and sure the next day I think we qualified for the Olympics so <laughs> it was quite quite a massive jump um, but yeah the performance and technical side now I've been doing and I've developed all the pathways and developed the squad system a lot of the event um, stuff and plus all the the NDPs, which are our national development plans to ensure gymnasts can come through. Um, I had a lot of help on the way, a lot of encouragement. Ever since I was a child, I was always encouraged, always supported, and was always told, like, you know, you're very good at this, we can keep going. And it gave me a lot of confidence. And having all that confidence actually helped an awful lot. It made me very ambitious. And certainly anyone who wants to go into, you know, working back in the sport, Retainment is really important and a lot of people do drop out, but if you love it and you know, you're ambitious at it, you know, you'll be very confident and that way you'll be able to strive to the highest level. Um, I've done quite a few Olympic Games and Youth Olympics as well. And, you know, it's such an opportunity and it's fantastic to see. And I'm very proud of Gymnastics Island and certainly the gymnasts we have because they've, I've seen them come through from seven years old, uh, especially in our females they start at seven for their first selection. And gymnastics is a very early specialized ocean sport. And to see the seven year olds come through to this year, finally turning senior and all in, we have six of them that could possibly make a Tokyo selection. Uh, we have a first reserve as well. And that has been a big step for our homegrown female gymnasts. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Um, with with seventy percent of the participation in um, gymnastics female, does that mean that there is uh, an inherent unconscious bias towards women um, in the sport and in the organisation? I wouldn't say so. I mean, we, we are actually I think eighty five percent female, and um, I think it's just been a cultural thing that's happened over the years in the past where it's seen as a female sport as such. Uh, but it's certainly somewhere we're trying to increase is the male and you know the male membership and encouraging the males to do the sport and I definitely see that changing I mean we've got two aspects of that where we've had successful athletes we've had Reese McGlennigan uh, and he's just qualified for the Olympics come through our own system since he was a child and that is very eye-opening for a lot of male gymnasts 
And the other side of it is how important gymnastics is for developing the overall body. It's good for your posture, your strength, your flexibility. It just gives you the whole package, to be honest. So starting any child in sport at a young age, male or female, I think is important and should even perhaps be compulsory because it really develops your body very well for any, any sport. Actually, how do you deal with uh, retention in, in, in the sport? It, it seems from the outside that a lot of the, the um, people who participate in gymnastics, they start very, very young and they also tend to leave the sport quite young. Uh, um, I, I don't know, you know, changes in people's body and in their lives, etc. may have a, a, a large part to play in that. But do you, can you, uh, or have you been able to retain them into the sport in, in coaching levels and coaching areas? Can they progress? Has there been that kind of progression or has there been a progression that you're happy with? Well, it's certainly something we're looking at into. I mean, it's funny you say that because our, we have only 1% of female gymnasts at age 17 to 18 competing. And, you know, underneath that, there's a huge percent of female gymnasts competing. So there is a, a big dropout. But what we have done is we have encouragement of doing coaching courses, going into judging, and also looking at the performance side of gymnasts, keeping them in the sport, the 1% 17 and 18 year olds of the year they turn senior, because that drops so low, we've had to do the pathway program, which is a 12 year program, which starts at age seven. And then from that age, we ensure that the gymnasts understand their pathway. They know what they're, where they're going. And it is long time in sport. And it doesn't mean you have to do everything at a young age, at a very, very pushed level and try and achieve all the hard skills and all the strength that you need at a young age we're trying to change that mindset you know it's a long time in sport and try and keep the retainment far longer and then they naturally go back in and it's funny because when the gymnasts are competing sort of at the older age group they're very interested in why am i getting that score what does that mean so they actually naturally want to go into sort of judging and then try and keep into coaching i mean the challenges we have is a lot of them go off to university and they're going to be students. But then what I am finding now is that they're coming back and having our full-time facilities is helping gymnasts to come back. Uh, we never used to have so many full-time facilities and now having them, it means that they can actually do a proper job in the sport. They can actually come back and be employed. So, you know, it's, it's a real change from the volunteers. Sally, you, you're, you're in, in, a, in a very different position to the other three panelists that we've spoken to today. Lisa and Bernard and Sally Corscadden are all obviously uh, operating in um, you know, the football, boxing uh, and the equestrian um, industry. These are enormous um, industries professionally as well as everything else. Gymnastics doesn't have that. So as somebody who is you know, uh, trying to develop and popularise, I suppose, a, a minority sport, certainly in this country, what are the difficulties that you um, you face, and more importantly, what's the what's the one single biggest bit of, of help that you could get or would want? Well, knowledge is very important. Knowing what you're doing if you're starting out, and we have recently developed a club startup um, which should help the club start and things like that, so that they can get educated education in gymnastics is crucial then you have to be able to manage the balance between your recreational programs and your performance programs and you know ensure that you've got the membership to run your club so there's a lot of knowledge that needs to be given to the coaches or to people starting out um, I mean there's certainly a lot of challenges I mean to start up a gymnastics club and to fully kit it out I mean the expense of that you know it's it's through the roof I mean it's probably half a million euro just to set up a gymnastics club so there is a lot of gradual setups so that people would probably start off in a small environment, a small hall perhaps, and then gradually build up. And we have some very good clubs now who have built up to memberships of maybe one and a half to 2,000 members of their club. And they've done an excellent job. They're running it properly with full-time managers and full-time coaches. Some of our clubs have 26 to 40 coaches actually working in them. And they actually starting off with the recreational programs and preschool and running things in the daytime. So all of these things is to, you know, develop a very good business. It's dominantly, it's a business and then your supply and the services of mm. your gymnastic I, classes. Actually a question for you. Uh, I don't know whether this is relevant to today or not, but I mean, if um, insurance, I, um, you're, you're in, in, 
working in areas and in sports where injuries are going to happen on a regular basis and quite severe injuries, has public liability insurance been an issue for any of you? So I'll start with Sally Johnson. Yes, um, insurance is very, very expensive for gymnastics. Um, I think insurance all over the country has risen dramatically in sport. Um, yes, there is the risk of injury. Accidents can happen. And, and it, is, it is our major expense. Okay. Um, Sally Corstadden, uh, I, I don't know how uh, the equestrian and the horse industry operates. Is, are there different rules for you or are you in the same situation? Um, Oh no, insurance, you know, ours is a high risk sport. Um, and yeah, it, insurance is becoming an increasing problem, especially with the, you know, the whole Brexit thing. Um, and it is, there's very few opportunities to find companies that want to take on uh, the equestrian um, insurance here. And another thing is, um, yeah, obviously the, you know, the facilities, again, are very expensive and anybody running shows, um, you know, the, another thing that gets them is the rates as well. You know, there could be a lot done by the government to help our sports uh, because we do create a lot of employment rurally and it could do with a lot of more investment. OK, uh, thank you both uh, very much. Uh, we've now um, got 10 to 15 minutes left. The floor is open to the Q&A and I'm... Uh, I'm Going to, I'm going to go to the gallery here now so I can get everybody up. And at this stage, I'm going to go to uh, Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, Sarah ha wants to know, how did you prove yourself to get that first position in a male-dominated sport? Um, Who gave you the first chance? Um, John Caulfield and Michael O'Neill. And to be fair, um, I got the chance to prove myself because those managers saw potential in me and they gave me an opportunity. If I hadn't had the opportunity, I couldn't have proved myself in that environment. So for me, it was the people that gave me the opportunity that are 100% responsible for me being able to prove myself because once I got the opportunities, the only thing I did was my job. When you went to John Caulfield in the first place, what qualifications did you have? What was he buying? Um, the, it actually, the first time was he needed, a, his team were playing a team in Dublin and he needed someone to go and have a look at them to come back and let them know how, what way they played and what their set pieces were like. So he asked me, would I go and, and watch them and, and would I let him know? Um, and, and then once I started to do that work, um, obviously I started to learn that maybe I was okay at it. And, um, at that time, I'll be honest, I didn't even know that opposition scouting existed. So, um, but they, he knew, I suppose, that I knew the game. And, uh, and from there, it became a career. And, and at that stage, I was a radio reporter because I thought that was the only way I could work in football. From the time I was a kid, I always wanted to work in football. Um, and as a reporter, um, I, I remember I always yearned to be on the grass. I always wanted to be down there and and be a part of it and, and it was like when I got the opportunity to be there I, I certainly wasn't going to pass it up and I worked hard every day to make sure that I could be the best that I could possibly be um, but societal norms at the time told me that the only way I could work in sport when I was 12, 13 was to be a reporter. Okay, Geraldine wants to know um, did you find that male co-workers uh, stand up for you and support you through the challenges? Um, Yes and no. So some did. And um, it probably was against the grain as well. So I really respect the people that did. Um, and others didn't. Um, and sometimes some of them came to me privately afterwards and apologized and said, look, it, was, it wasn't right. Um, I probably, but I just wanted you to know I don't think like that. And that's not what I do. But they didn't feel strong enough to do it in front of the group or in front of the people who were passing comments so um but they they felt that the only way they could do that was to come to me privately but there were others that would say no not acceptable and like i say it wasn't that it was normal that i experienced those in incidents they were more isolated than they were commonplace but when they did occur some people did and say absolutely not acceptable um and some people didn't. And then there was others that maybe instigated or thought that was fine and that was normal. 
Okay, Peter uh, says he remembers meeting you post match with Martin O'Neill in the Northern Ireland dressing room. Uh, you needed to be there for your job. And he says it's fantastic to see uh, what you've gone on to achieve. He'd be interested to understand the journey you took and the measures that sports administrators can take to help break down barriers that in the past would have denied people like you access. I think um, the most important thing that anybody can do is to create a safe place. Because I'll be honest with you, I was 10 years in men's football and it wasn't until that seminar in January 2019 that was the first time I felt safe in the sport. Um, it was the first time I felt genuinely supported. Um, there were times, and that's why I said on my slide, I felt isolated at times because I felt I couldn't be weak. I couldn't give in and let people know that it was hard um, because I felt that would give the reason to not allow a woman to be in the environment. So I had to stay strong and I had to stay resilient. And I'm really fortunate that I had amazing people around me, really good people who gave me opportunities, but I got to work with some really, really good people. But like I said, there were days when I faced challenges that really made me question whether it was worth it or not. But um, so what I would say to anybody in administration is to ensure that you create an environment where you and everybody feel safe to number one, um, say that any type of sexist or racist or ageist or any kind of um, behavior that it does not promote equality is just not tolerated and for everybody to take that up you know to have the courage to do that because sometimes like I said earlier if you're going against the norm and if you're going to do something that's different and sometimes standing up and, and saying that that type of behavior is not acceptable is different and it's not easy, but the more people do it, the more people say it's not right. I mean, I've already had some messages from, from people in, in different countries that are watching this today telling me that they've, they, they feel all of a sudden not alone. And that's, that's, why I, that's why it's important to share your experiences. And, and I was guilty for a long time of not, not sharing them and, and just keeping it quiet. And, but like I said, it wasn't my overwhelming experience. My overwhelming experience was positive and I had good people and good experiences, but there were incidences where, um, the, 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 you know, and you do need that support. And, and so Peter, be supportive and, and create the environment of safety for people to learn and to, for people to experience and make mistakes and not, and not pay a massive penalty for them because that's part of the journey is learning. It, it's extraordinary, uh, Lisa, and I, I would address this general point to, to the, the, ma the male um, observers of this webinar. How many of us have ever said in our professional lives that we didn't feel safe in the places that we work? That's not something that men say and men encounter. You might encounter it on a Saturday night walking down the street with a bunch of yell who's coming out of a pub, but not in your workplace. And the idea that, that you would only feel safe as late as last year in the working environment that you're in and use that word safe is very telling and, uh, and and an indictment of just how society operates in general i hope things are changing and that what we're doing here is helping to change that but it is interesting i mean language and words are very important and you choose your words very carefully and that's not a word that any man would ever use about his workplace but you chose to use it about yours and it, it you know that's a big lesson and a big takeaway for all of us um just to remind us that we are uh, we are uh, there's a few things that we need to to, to say uh, Abe, thank everybody i also need to remind people that gymnastics ireland is uh, one of the largest sports in ireland and has a club network of professional gyms valued at about 30 million euro and employs 1500 people i think when i said um one of the minority sports i might have offended somebody i certainly didn't intend to do that or don't play their importance of what they do but uh, um, i suppose in terms of the levels of publicity they get they would be um, um, uh, on a on a slightly different level to the other people that we've spoken to today very quickly in terms of uh, just a final question to everybody can i go to sally of course Gadden, uh, and to sally johnson starting with sally johnson how important is the support network for women Sorry, um, how important is the support network? The support network is extremely important. Uh, we have a huge membership. I think it's really at 33,000 and the majority being young. So the support network around all of that, you know, it has to be flawless. 
Uh, we have a lot of policies in place. We have a lot of education. We have a lot of things to make sure that everything is supported 360, right the way through a gymnast career, right the way through to becoming perhaps a judge or an international recognized judge. Sally Korsgaden, in a, in a, in a sport where um, gender equality is, uh, is possibly ahead of other sports, uh, have you had issues with support network uh, for women? I suppose not. We've just sort of always thought of, of um, you know, having our own support networks. And it's only since I started actually doing more work with the Institute of Sport and speaking with the physiologists and the sort of nutritionists and likes of Sharon Madigan, that, send, that then you actually have to look at, well, actually, we do have to treat, uh, maybe give, treat each, you know, the male and female athletes slightly differently. And there are certain needs that a female athlete uh, could do with, which uh, we might not be actually supporting in the right way. So that sort of opened my eyes. It sort of, it was always a case of, well, you just had to get on with it. Whereas actually there's no reason why we shouldn't actually you know, support our female athletes in a special way if they need, if that's their need to make them a better athlete. We should look at it the same way as we, you know, if there's something a male athlete needs that's slightly different, you know, from a sports psychologist, a nutritionist or a physiologist, it shouldn't be, you know, it should be tailored for each athlete, whether they're male or female, you tailor the uh, supports around them for their own needs to make them the best athlete. So we, I don't feel we, we were actually really aware of actually we, you know, we have to make that definition. Bernard, um, you're trying to build a support network for women. And I suppose you're in a, the unenviable position of being a man in a male dominated um, um, sport, trying to build pathways for women. The obvious thing is to get women to do that, but you don't have the women there yet. How are you going to achieve that? Uh, I don't think it's an enviable um, position. I think we have a we have a federation um, as a whole that wants to increase female participation, both from an athlete point of view and from a coaching perspective. I think it's just about getting the right supports around the coach development, you know, and and that's not just from a technical point of view. It's from a communication. It's a, uh, understanding, you know, personalities. It's it's it's. It's more on the social aspect as well. So there's a whole curriculum that can be put in place to support um, female athletes on, and female coaches uh, to fully develop um, into world-class leaders. You, you have a superstar in, in Katie and what she does when she finishes in the pros will be very interesting to see. You've got Kelly coming up, you've got the watches. You've got potential poster women for young Irish girls. And if they decide once their boxing careers or sporting careers are over that they want to go into coaching, this is going to make your job so much easier, isn't it? I, I, but a lot will hinge on whether people like that decide to follow that path. Yeah, well, well, we do try to encourage them whilst they're in the middle of their career. So to actually take advantage of opportunities to, to get their, I suppose, their first coaching badges to work with experts in strength and conditioning and nutrition and physiology. Um, to understand all the requirements that go along with boxing. As I said, it's not just about understanding how to hold pads and you know, tech, tech, technical aspects of boxing. It's about having a, a, having a holistic approach to it. Um, and whether you're male or female, you know, those opportunities should be in place. And, you know, but I, I do agree with, I, I actually love the presentation that Lisa had earlier on, around some people do need a bigger box, you know, because they do need that opportunity to develop a little bit more um, than their counterparts. Okay, uh, listen, I want to thank you all uh, on behalf of everybody who's watching. The, uh, I don't know what the numbers were, we, did we make the 130 plus? We did indeed. I want to thank the four uh, uh, panelists, Sally Johnson, Sally Corsgaden, Lisa Fallon, and of course Bernard Dunn. Um, it's been a revelation, an eye opener, um, a very pleasant eye-opener in some cases, but again, with a little bit of what Lisa said there, also a, a sort of unpleasant eye-opener in the sense that we have a long way to go to get where we need to be, which is where everybody gets treated equally and gets the same opportunities and gets the same rewards for the same efforts. But that's what gender equality is about. That's what we're hoping uh, things like this will help with. This is the first of a series of four webinars uh, that the Olympic Federation of Ireland is holding every Wednesday, two o'clock. Um, the next one, next Wednesday, same time, same place, will be on the subject of leadership. 
I hope that uh, as many of you as, uh, uh, as you can will join us and possibly you'll tell your friends or tell other people who might be interested in this and we'll get even more people. Um, there, certainly, it's been, it's been a pleasure and an honour for me to be asked to do it and it's also been an education. So to everybody who participated, I want to thank you all and hopefully we will see you all again next Wednesday. Good afternoon.